Hotel. On the line with us today is a new guest to the program, David Morgan. David has been nice enough to join us here on video, even though I am not set up on video. David, thanks so much for coming on the program. Colin, great to be with you. Thank you. You are a huge advocate of silver. You're one of the most prominent names in the silver business. I saw a talk that you did several years back where you touched on the silver to gold ratio, and that is a ratio that has hit an extreme of late. It's around 75 to 1, if I'm not mistaken. What, what do you see happening between silver and gold, despite the market hitting a new low right now? Well, first of all, you know, there's a pretty large contingency, even within the precious metals group, that the gold-silver ratio is meaningless but it's got meaning because the meaning is what is how many ounces of silver does it take to buy a price of gold i mean it has absolute meaning in that sense beyond that if you go back into monetary history and you go you know like in our book the silver manifesto we show what the ratios have been throughout history and really from about 3200 uh, bc to present day you're looking at a gold to silver ratio that's been basically under the 15, 16 to 1 ratio up until the last 120 years or so. So the gold silver ratio certainly means something. It means, you know, what, what the two are uh, relative to each other. If silver is outperforming gold or gold is outperforming silver. And it's really only been since silver has been demonetized and remonetized <clears throat> where you see these extreme levels where you've seen actually 100 to 1 a couple of times. So right now, I've always believed that the basis of both the precious metals serve basically the same function. Gold is money and more recognized as money than silver, although the truth of the matter is silver served as money more places more often and far more transactions than gold in the monastery sphere. The word gold, uh, silver and the word money are synonymous in the Romance languages. If you say plata, you're saying silver, and it also simultaneously means money. So if you told someone in the Hispanic language that silver is not money, you'd have to say a plata is not no plata. It would have no meaning. Absolutely, we'd be saying that silver isn't money or money is not money, or <clears throat> and it would have no meaning. So silver does have a, a large uh basis for being a monetary metal again it's been in the last though really since 1965 onward where it was officially taken out of the money supply by the u.s government and as the years have gone by it's become more and more of an industrial metal and i certainly admit that i mean silver is kind of a, a dual purpose metal it's certainly an industrial metal as well as a monetary metal so back to the ratio when I said that silver bull market started, it was September 2003, which is actually a little bit after the gold bull market had started. And the ratio was roughly 80 to 1. Today, we're in the high 70s, as you said. So if you started at that point, and of course, you can always you know, make figures work your way if you want. And I'm not trying to. I'm being very honest here. I said, this is the bottom. It's going to break out above the $5 level. It did. And that ratio of 81 is, is actually at 75 to 1, so it's slightly uh, done better than gold from that point in time. Certainly since the metals have fallen off and probing these lows, uh, gold has done better. It's held more, and that's to be expected. My 40 years in the, in the commodity sector and the precious metals particularly, uh, silver is far more volatile and it swings much wider, up, you know, higher highs and lower lows. So not, that's nothing to be... Uh, frightened of, other than to know that that's the way silver is. It's a smaller market and moves. So I believe that uh, the real ratio, or the natural ratio, is about 10 to 1, or actually 9 to 1. That's how it comes out of the earth. There's nothing magic about that number. A lot of people think that that means that's what the true monetary ratio should be between the two. It's really not true. Uh, you could argue that uh, platinum is about 15 times rarer than gold, and therefore it should trade at 15 times the price of gold. Of course, that's not ever been the case. But it does give an idea of whether something's overvalued or undervalued. So probably beating us to death. The fact is silver is extremely undervalued. Gold is undervalued. And when the metals reassert themselves as safe havens or crisis hedges 
or a confidence boost. In other words, the trust or confidence is lost in the system further than it already has been. And there's a run to gold. There will be a spillover into silver. And because it's a smaller market and because it's more affordable, you will see that ratio narrow significantly. So let's say from the 75 to 1 ratio, I expect it to get below the ratio it's already achieved in this bull market, which is 35 to 1. And I think it'll go back to what's called the classic or monetary ratio, which is about 15 or 16 to 1. And I actually believe that it could hit what the natural ratio is, which is how it comes out of the ground, which is roughly 10 to 1. I think that's a possibility. And as an aside, uh, Bunker Hunt uh, passed away recently. Uh, and I'm close to um, one of the trust managers uh, for the Hunt family. He and I have known each other for years. And Bunker actually believed way back in the 70s. I'm not, I don't know what his case is now. And obviously mm -hmm. he's deceased, as I just said. But at that time, he thought that the correct ratio between gold and silver is about five to one. And I say all that to say this, that the market knows more than any of us. But I know markets. And at 75 to 1, silver is extremely undervalued. It's a better buy than gold at this point in time, but it's much more volatile and higher risk. And because of that, I think everyone should own both metals. But if you're young and aggressive, it can handle the risk. Silver is by far a better purchase at this point in time. I appreciate the point you just made that just because silver to gold in the ground is 10 to 1 does not necessarily dictate that the price should be 10 to 1. And that's a point that Rick Rule made while on the program about a month ago. With, with that being said, the question I want to ask you is, has your research given you any answers as to why over the last hundred years we have gone so far away from the natural rate or the monetary rate of 15 to 1 and how we got to this point of being at 75 to 1 ratio? Well, at the risk of looking like a conspiracy theorist, uh, the facts are that it's been demonetized. Most people have no idea that silver was once a monetary metal. They um, <clears throat> look at it as uh, an industrial metal, uh, sometimes even almost said as, as a base metal. And uh, its function is very, very important in uh, the industries, especially in the electronics world. There's a big surge uh, of the use of silver from about uh, the early 2000s or late 90s up until about 2005, 2006. And that continues, but the efficiencies have gotten better. So let me state it more accurately. If you go back to the late 90s, the amount of industrial use of silver is about 35% of the market. Today, it's about 50% of the market. These are round numbers. And so there's a big surge for, oh, eight years or so. And it's leveled off. The, um, amount of silver that's used in industry is significant. It's over 500 million ounces a year, and uh, it continues to be that amount, but it hasn't really grown any. Uh, again, primarily due to the electronic devices, you know, your iPad, your iPhone, your Android phone, all these small devices that use a small amount of silver, but they're ubiquitous. There's so many on the planet that if you add it in total, you're looking at a significant amount of silver. So it's been demonetized. It's, it's a, the value that the market places on it as something that's used in industry, not as something that is used as a store of wealth or protection of wealth. And I think that's the main reason that the psychology has changed. And because the psychology has changed, the price has changed. Uh, all markets uh, move because of the margin. In other words, you know, what is the utility value of anything? And the utility value is gold. I mean, 95% or higher of all the gold that's ever been mined is above ground and still available at some price. Or in silver, that's not the case because so much has been used up. And so silver is actually scarcer on an above ground investment quality basis than gold. Gold is, depends which uh, study you look at, but again, around numbers, are going to maybe 5 billion ounces of gold above ground in almost all of its investment form. And silver, you're looking at roughly 2 billion ounces in investment form. So it's a smaller market. And because there is some demand at the margin, meaning for investment, wealth protection, uh, confidence, crisis heads, safe haven, whatever you want to name it, 
because of the monetary aspect that still exists, when that side of the demand equation increases, you'll see silver accelerate and it'll come back down and you could get back to the classic ratio, the monetary ratio. But the problem with the, going a step further, the problem with the 15 to one ratio or 16 to one ratio, it's been both, was when uh, Sir Isaac Newton, who was, became uh, knighted and became Sir, uh, wasn't anything to do with his physics knowledge, which was significant, as we all know, is because the uh, Bank of England was having so many problems and they were basically in a financial crisis, if you will, and he put them back on a gold standard. And when he put them back on a gold standard, it basically righted the ship that was going down. And that's how he became Sir Isaac Newton for that, not his physics knowledge. And of course, then they were asked, or he was asked, you know, as the mint master, what would be the correct ratio? And he said 15 and a half to one, because he looked out the window and saw that's what the market had determined at that point in time. But that's incorrect. And it's hard for me to dispute with Sir Isaac Newton. But the point is that he, the market determines what the ratio is. So if we were able to say, well, the market, we need both the monetary metals, and the market will determine what it is, I'm not going to fix it, it won't be fixed, uh, then we would have, uh, you know, for a lot of uh, monetary history, a different ratio. It could be 12 to 1, it could be 20 to 1, it would vary. But anyway, I digress, come back to the point, the main point being in summary, silver is undervalued relative to almost any other commodity on the planet by far. And if you've got the uh, conviction to buy into this market at these levels, I would certainly recommend that you consider doing so strongly and also anticipate that it could go lower because we are probing the lows uh, in both, both the metals right now. I've, I've heard you say in the past that silver is money and gold is used for a storage of wealth. Pretty common sense analysis in that uh, silver can be more easily traded because gold is made in uh, too big of denominations for, for its size and hence for daily transactions, uh, silver makes a little more sense to use. That leads me to a question on if there is a major financial crisis and we, we go back to a system of using uh, silver and gold, the fiat currencies collapse, that would make me think that silver might catch a much stronger bid than gold. I think you make a valid point, but I'd like to point out that I've somewhat changed my mind on that only because of uh, the way the world works and the way things progress. Right now, there's the ability to use a silver and gold backed debit card. And it's, uh, there's a few available. And in that case, you really don't need to worry about whether you're spending gold or silver because you're talking really, you know, grams of gold or, you know, partial ounces of silver or whatever for settlement purposes. And it's up to the depository to take that amount of metal out of your account. So from a practical perspective, uh, it's not as important as you just outlined, Colin, uh, but it is still valid. Uh, and of course, it depends where you are in the world. I mean, uh, depending, you know, if you're in a, the electronic banking sphere, which is most of the world, admittedly, but uh, you could be in uh, areas that you know, flea markets or whatever, where, you know, the hard money itself would be more utilized. Of course, silver certainly is more uh, usable than gold because of the reasons you outlined. I mean, an ounce of gold, you're looking still at, you know, $1,140 an ounce, <clears throat> whatever the price is today. And so you're looking at roughly 15. So point well taken. I, I want to digress a bit further. When Utah passed the hard money bill, which is what I call it, I forget the exact title, and it was legal in Utah to transact anywhere in the state, as long as both parties were mutually in agreement. Uh, the only way I sought to facilitate that would to be to use a debit card of some type that uh, a depository held the metal, gold or silver or both. And then it was transparent at the merchant level where you went into XYZ store to buy an ABC product and all you did was hand them their debit card because, you know, the merchants are very used to that transaction. They wouldn't know any difference. And the only difference would be that you would be debited in metal instead of debit debited in fiat dollars. And that idea really never took hold in Utah. I worked 
with uh, some of the founders that actually proposed the bill to try to promote that idea. But uh, again, it didn't take hold, but it has taken hold in uh, here in Spokane, actually. A friend of mine heard me speak on that very topic and has done so. In fact, I've got one in my wallet and I use it on a fairly regular basis. And of course, that leads to the next question. Well, David, you know, why would you be spending silver when the price keeps dropping? The answer is I'm not. It functions both sides of the equation, meaning that I have the precious metal side of the debit card and add the cash side of the debit card. So I use it as a store of value side, which I don't touch the metals part. And I use it as any debit card for any bank issue. And I just debit the uh, cash side. But when I see an opportunity like I'm seeing right now, I might move some of the cash side into more metal, average my cost down on the price of silver and gold, and then have that stored and uh, be able to use it, you know, in the future when the prices recover. David, you keep pointing out that the markets determine the price, and markets, at least over time, are pretty uh, are a pretty efficient or is a pretty efficient vehicle that is hard for any single person to corner. Yet a lot of people are convinced that gold and particularly silver have been manipulated for decades even by the government or governments of the world. And for others, it's hard to imagine that a group could hold such an important worldwide market in their favor for such a long time. So I want to ask you how much of the, the price of gold and silver being where they are today is due to uh, some type of manipulation? Oh, great question. And I don't want to sidestep it at all. I think the best answer I can give is to, you know, get our book, The Silver Manifesto, either in you know, hard copy form, which I think is the best because it's like a textbook. You could read it, reread it, highlight it, make notes on the margins, that type of thing, or get the electronic version, which is cheaper. And, and go through the book, starting with fractional reserve banking, then you go into fractional reserve bullion banking, and then you can go into how the paper paradigm works. But all markets have to meet supply and demand. The problem is, keeping the price managed is that the supply that's required can be met for a very long time with the paper promise. So in other words, an investor, as an example, might buy a large quantity of silver and get a certificate that says that they have this much quantity of silver. It's held in this vault and, and that's what they receive. And the bank or the, um, entity, whatever it be, uh, might rehypothecate that silver re or swap it out or loan it or sell it more than once, really. And this has taken place in both these markets, gold and silver markets. Having said that, I can't uh, neglect the fact that the physical market will eventually take over the price. And so no matter how much the paper paradigm works to keep the price at a certain level, because it's really adding a lot of supply. I mean, if you have the true physical supply and no paper supply whatsoever, and it was a cash market only, and it was dealt in physical realm completely, you would have a different pricing mechanism than you have today. But when you can satisfy the demand with paper, which is just a promise to deliver in the future, then it will suppress the price. Because why? Because you've increased the supply significantly. So that's the essence of it. But having said that, you can still go down to your coin dealer and buy silver for you know fifteen dollars an ounce plus their you know markup, which might be seven or eight percent today. I'm not sure, but as the market goes lower, the premium is usually go higher. The point being is that until that physical demand became sufficient enough where the physical supply couldn't be met, then you would see price pressure move to the upside. So you basically have two markets in silver and it's in gold as well. You've got the COMEX price, which is basically the paper price, and people, maybe 1% or less, will stand for delivery on that price basis. And then you have the other market, which is the retail market, which covers everything from government minted coins, privately minted medallions, one ounce wafers, 10 ounce bars, 100 ounce bars, all that in both the silver world and the gold world. And that has a different demand dynamic. And because of the different dyna demand dynamic, 
you can see great discrepancies between the commercial bar form of gold and the commercial bar form of silver and the retail price. In 2008, as you well know, Colin, we saw like 1350 silver when the commercial bar form was under nine. And that's one heck of a spread. So we're seeing that again today in the silver market. The U.S. Mint is out of silver, quote unquote. My, my exact words, not theirs. Point is that they are not going to make the availability of sil silver eagles until August. Uh, you've seen a big rush into like the Perth Mint because silver eagles are unavailable currently. And this is something that's uh, different than a lot of markets, let's say. So the amount of sales of silver on paper dwarfs any other commodity. I mean, Ted Butler's probably been at the fore of this, Ed Steer as well, where if you look at what the ratio or the cover ratio is on all the commodities versus the physical realm and the paper realm, what you'll find is that you might have, uh, you know, a month's worth of coverage in a certain commodity, but silver, you're like six months or whatever. I don't have the numbers in my head after the chart again, but the idea is very sound that silver more than any other commodity is satisfied by paper much more than physical. In other words, the ratio between the amount of physical uh, supply that exists versus the amount of paper that exists as quote unquote supply in silver far exceeds any other commodity. And that's something that kind of raises an eyebrow. The last point I'll make, and I'll try to be brief, is the Silver Users Association. Recently, you've seen some of these silver users that, uh, as Ted has said, silver abusers, and I agree, uh, left the SUA for whatever reason. They're very quiet about it. They don't make a big fanfare about it. But I think there's a lot of tension in the silver market for the last several years, and I think the tension is starting to increase more and more. I know that's difficult to say with the price being as low as it is. Nonetheless, it's a small market, and it doesn't take a lot of new buying pressure to force it, especially when you had this you know, paper paradigm working so well for so long. And when it starts to break down, this thing could snap and it could accelerate the silver price rather rapidly. I know I've been in this market for years. I've seen it move to the upside. I saw what happened with the Hunt brothers. I saw what happened when the COMEX had uh, problems meeting the demand. I saw where they went in and changed the rules and basically said you can only make a sell order. You can't have a buy order anymore. And so I've gone through it one time. And that was back when silver was not really as well known as an investment vehicle as it is now. Certainly the hunts had something to do with that. I'm not trying to discount that. What I'm stating is silver's availability is much greater now to the general public than it was back then. And it's a worldwide market. Whereas back in the Hunt Brother days, it was basically a U.S. phenomena only. This time, it'll be a global phenomena. India loves silver. They love gold, too, and they've been buying a lot of gold uh, recently. But if you go back in history, most of the women stored their wealth with silver bracelets in India. That hasn't gone away. Uh, all, again, the uh, Romance languages, all of South America, uh, use silver as a store of value. Wow, that was uh, probably the most level-headed answer I've ever heard in terms of uh, conspiracies and manipulation around the silver and gold market. made made a ton of sense without without sounding too far off the edge at all. Um, I want to ask you: silver and gold are both breaking down right now. Uh, new lows for the for the current bear market. You're tuned in closer than anybody. Uh, nobody knows what's going to happen, but what's your sense on what's going on right now? Well, I want to back up slightly. Uh, you know, you asked about the manipulation. Part of the manipulation is psychological. It's where people that are true believers that held silver for a long time, and I know a few of these people, in fact, several, and, you know, they were holding silver strongly from, like, the $30 level down to, say, 26 And once it broke below 26 you know, they pretty much gave up. They might have held it for another year or whatever, and then it hit 20. It's like, oh, my God, I can't stand it anymore. So you broke the psychology, which is very important in all markets, stock market, commodities markets, bond markets. I mean, basically all based on faith and confidence, except the metals are the one thing you can trust no matter what. But back on point, yeah, so once you hit a new low, 
then only the market knows how low is low. Personally, you know, with, with gold and silver both breaking down, as you said, one, I won't give a number. Uh, well, I probably will. But uh, <clears throat> the idea is, I think it'll be short-lived. Uh, the summer doldrums are something that I've lived through most of my life. And it took me a few years to, like, get in sync with it that uh, the fund managers have gone in Europe. There isn't much jewelry demand. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why the precious metals are very dull and usually hit lows in the summer. August is traditionally the low month for gold. And so this is not a surprise. So we've had all this pressure. The psychology is very negative. The sentiment is extremely low. So to hit a new low isn't like a big surprise to me. A lot of analysts said that, um, you know, the new, a new low would take place. I actually interviewed one, put them in the Morgan Report. I disagreed at the time, but it looks like they're going to end up being right. Silver's intraday low is 14.15 in the aftermarket or the Asian market. Uh, we're not that low yet. Uh, until that's taken out, then I'm right. In other words, meaning that the, that low has not been taken out. But on a close-only basis in the uh, U.S. markets, it's probably hitting a new low today. I'd have to look, but we're doing the interview. Regardless, I don't think we're going to see silver go to nine. I, my best guess would be like 14, maybe. I don't know. I, and gold, I'd have a hard time seeing gold under 1,000. Uh, it could. Uh, these metals can do anything on a temporary basis. That's why you don't want to get too excited about buying the low. If you've got cash or you've been out of this market for a while or you're getting back in or you never thought you'd buy the metals and now they look like it's just too good an opportunity for whatever your motivation is, I would suggest averaging in over the next few months, so July, August, September, that type of thing. I still think strongly that uh, by the end of September, early October, we're going to see a dynamic shift in the fundamentals of the marketplace as a whole. It could be driven by Greece, it could be driven by the bond market, it could be driven by an interest rate increase by the Fed, it could be driven by uh, the European banks, it could be driven by a war uh, or rumors of war. It could be something to do with the Middle East, it could be something to do with oil. I mean, there's so many variables out there, I certainly couldn't pick one. Or I could just say a combination of those things come together in a synergistic manner that cause more uncertainty in the marketplace and there's a safe haven status available in gold and silver and they start to catch that type of a modality where people are ready to start buying again. So I really believe that. I really think that uh, we've just got a few more months to wade through this uh, very difficult period for precious metals investors. But by the end of the year, you'll look back and say, oh, finally, now I know the low is in. But we don't know that yet. We don't know how low is the low. My final question for you, David, I saw an interview that you did with USA Watchdog, and the title of that interview was Major Market Crash Coming in September 2015. There's been talk from uh, a few uh, people, more so on the fringe, but talking about this concept of a Shemitah with the cleansing of debts that happens every seven years. And I have no idea if your, your concept of a crash in September uh, has anything to do with that, but it certainly coincides with the same market crash dates that they're talking about. Uh, can you talk about why you see a market crash coming then? Well, I wouldn't say market crash. I'm not sure that's what I said, although I think that's what Greg used on the title, and that's fine. I don't have a lot of control. You know, I do the interviews, and then people will, you know, take it maybe out of context. I might have said crash. I don't know. Uh, I'm not going to make any excuses. I looked at it from the seven-year cycle and not the Shemitah cycle, which I became familiar with after I did that interview, or maybe just before. I can't recall. But uh, basically, the stock market cycle and where you are in the presidential year and basically intuition and being in this market for so long. So it's kind of a combination of, of cycle theory, which I'm not a big proponent of, of how bad the sentiment was, of knowing that the lows are usually hit in the summer, knowing that there's usually strength, so it's a seasonality, which I do believe in, and cycle theory, which I believe in somewhat, and how long this market has been negative and how high the stock market was relative to the value. And that the stock markets have a propensity on a seasonality of going down September, October. And that was the main, you know, I, I weighted that more than almost anything else. 
And of course, gold is the most negatively correlated asset to the stock market. So based on all those things, it's kind of combination, and I threw it out there because I believe it. I really think that's about as long as we can go in this bear market or this bear trend within what I still think is a secular bull market for the precious metals. I think the stock market has gotten as high as it can get to uh, at this point in time. It could certainly go a little higher here for the next month or so, although that's to be determined. And so basically all this stuff added up together, and I said, look, I really think September, October, is going to be it. And then, of course, you know, more uh, information came out from all different angles. Shemitah certainly being one and well recognized. In fact, uh, Jeff Berwick uh, did an interview with me, uh, I think a month later after the um, Greg Hunter interview on USA Watchdog and asked me a lot about the Shemitah. Well, I have read both the books. In fact, one of my um, one of the people that saw me at the uh, Liberty Mastermind conference in, uh, I think it was in Las Vegas, uh, came up after the show and really wanted me to read The Harbinger. And I'd never even heard of it. I hadn't heard of Jonathan Kahn or anything. And he sent me the book and I read it. And it was mostly about 9 11. But the Shemitah was mentioned in there. And it's kind of a fascinating book. And in fact, this uh, friend wanted me to say, was giving me the idea that I would know the exact date of uh, you know when things would happen, which really really isn't true in the Harbinger, whereas in, or to my reading of it anyway, but reading the Shemitah is pretty clear on when it begins and when it ends and what the uh, past has shown. So probably off, off topic a little bit, but I still, you know, for my reasons, and yes, it does line up with Shemitah. Uh, and I'll say one more thing. I think it's important, you know, at my age and the amount of experience I have in these markets, there's something called a self-fulfilling prophecy. And it's just what it says. If enough people believe something's going to happen, it will happen. Because enough people will say, you know what, it's September, I'm getting out of the stock market, and I'm getting into gold, or whatever. Because they've heard it enough times from myself and many, many other people. I'm certainly not the only one. I mean, look at, you know, Jonathan Kahn versus myself. I mean, he's sold, you know, I don't know how many books and, you know, the amount of silver manifestos we've sold and it doesn't even talk about this date. Uh, <clears throat> It's very, very small relative to what he sold. So the, the word is out there, and these self-fulfilling prophecies do occur. I have seen it in the markets before. So that alone could take this market the directions that we outline. David, there are so many other questions I'd like to ask you, but we're running out of time here. So rather than extending this interview, I'll try and get you back on next month. For one thing, and we can save it till then, I want to get your opinion on mining equities. We didn't even have time to get into that. Uh, in terms of your book, The Silver Manifesto, I don't need to ask you about it. You've already given us a great look into that content. You have a wealth of knowledge. Uh, our, our audience should go to www.silver-investor.com, and I believe the book is available through the website. David, thank you so much for coming on the show with us today. My pleasure. Thanks for the tough questions. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bid. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen? Are you too stupid? <laughs>